If you are like me, then chances are you have seen some interesting UFO footage in your time. And I think most of us would agree that 95% of UFO videos out there can be easily dismissed as nothing more than a hoax or misidentified object, while 5% of them are truly mysterious. However, sometimes a UFO video is just really special, and that's what we have here. The story begins in 2009, when a video would surface on YouTube called UFO Chase in Spain. The description reads, Video of a UFO chased by fighter jets from the Spanish Air Force, recorded from a fishing boat in Galician waters. The video starts in the middle of the events as two fighter jets soar by this boat with a man pointing at them. After a few seconds, the men would turn to the right and point to this UFO not that high above the water, and apparently it sees the oncoming fighter jets heading straight towards it. The UFO then becomes an unidentified submerged object as it quickly drops below the jets and plunges down into the depths of the ocean, disappearing out of sight as the jets soar by. The fishermen, whose faces are blurred out, are freaked out by what they see. It's then that a helicopter hovers above the ship and on a mega speaker system in Spanish states, leave the area immediately and head to the port. There you will receive instructions. Leave the area and go to the port. Then, the helicopter flies off and the video ends. The video has been uploaded to a few different channels and I was unable to find the original uploader, but I did find an article in the Wayback Machine that detailed one specific quote in the comment section. This user would claim that the military had been chasing a foreign object when it made a dive into the sea to escape, and that the military helicopter told the fishermen to leave the area. The comment further states that the fishermen thought it was their duty to report what had happened, so after blurring their faces, they would send the video along with the note explaining the situation to someone in the media who eventually uploaded it. Now most of you all will think that it is nothing more than CGI, but what I find interesting is the sheer number of comments in the video section that wholeheartedly believe it. In fact, the archived article about the video calls it one of the best UFO sightings ever, and using a browser translator will let you scroll through hundreds of comments talking about how it's one of the few legit UFO videos out there. However, after doing my due diligence, I was able to find two videos that showed the actual behind the scenes on how this production company made the video, allegedly. And unless you believe this is a government cover-up, then this mystery is pretty well debunked. In fact, I found an article from 2023 that stated the whole thing was created for a Spanish advertising campaign in 2009 and was then forgotten about and then started being shared on social media 14 years later and labeled as a real sighting. However, I was also able to find other reports that the whole thing was actually a tribute to the Orson Welles War of the Worlds radio broadcast. May 2017, a 33-year-old woman was walking across Putney Bridge in London, England when a bizarre incident would occur. A male jogger who was running past her would randomly shove the woman down into the street. The woman was just narrowly missed by a bus thanks to an alert driver who turned out of the way at the last second, and it was all captured on CCTV. What makes this case crazier is the woman did not even know the man. It was completely random. It wouldn't be until three months later, in August, that the CCTV footage would be released to the public and police started investigating. The suspect was identified as a white man in his 30s with brown eyes and short brown hair. The police would look at more than 50 suspects and end up arresting three different men, all who were released without charge. The jogger would actually return to the bridge 15 minutes later and cross in the other direction. It was then that the woman tried to confront him and he did not acknowledge her. Police would eventually close the investigation as they exhausted every lead, but online sleuths still pursue the man, as it seems mind-boggling that no one knows who he was. A few theories have came up. Some speculate he was a businessman whose room was nearby, allowing him to quickly get changed and catch a flight back out before he could get caught. Some also suspected a diplomat who had immunity from prosecution, or even someone with mental illness. The more bizarre theories suggested an assassin 
possibly hired by a former love interest of the woman. July 9, 1973, Crofton, Maryland. A construction crew would show up to a work site to begin work on a parking lot that would be used for some townhouses that were slated to be built. It's here that this crazy mystery would begin, because as the bulldozer made its way over the open ground, the earth beneath it would begin to collapse in. Workers would rush over to see what was happening and were bewildered when they seen numerous underground chambers and tunnels that seemed to go back to a center chamber. The tunnels themselves were only about 20 inches wide. That evening, the executive of the construction company told his son about the tunnels. He, in turn, would contact a friend who was a local art instructor to help him explore the area. These two men quickly realized the formation was extensive with large and long chambers with secondary tunnels split off that existed 25 feet below the Earth's surface. Other than some strange markings found on some of the walls, they were completely absent of any debris and the two men would find no clues to how the caves had been built. The odd news would quickly spread throughout town and a local farmer and amateur archaeologist, William Dokins, would soon hear and offered to help examine the tunnels. He soon realized how big of a discovery this was and the men soon contacted authorities in Maryland and Washington, D.C., as well as some surrounding states in hopes of getting the site recognized and maybe even investigated. However, since this was a construction project, the men only had a small amount of time to find a professional archaeologist. The Maryland Geological Survey would be one of the first to look, and they quickly determined that they were natural formations, like that of limestone caves. Other scientists contacted weren't really interested because the discovery didn't really match their forte, while one scientist said it was caused by underground water erosion, which was ironic, since he didn't even go look at the site. Sadly, by the time the correct scientists had heard about the discovery and were super interested in studying it, the construction company had got tired of waiting and had already destroyed the tunnels. Luckily, before this could happen, the three men would contact their friends and family to help study it in detail. This led to maps being made, measurements taken, soil collected, and photographs and plaster cast of the odd markings found. However, time would go by and the story was pretty much forgotten until 30 years later in 2003 when the Enigma Project, which is a private-based group in Maryland that investigate claims of unexplained phenomena, was contacted by an independent researcher named Mr. Carl B., who would reopen the research into the Crofton Tunnels he would find that William Dokins, who was now deceased at this point, had allegedly written a full report on his investigation of the tunnels, but sadly, this report was never found. Carl would not give up so easily, though. He spent several months visiting friends and family members of Williams' family, where he eventually found the document and sent the Enigma Project a copy. Even though William Dokins was an amateur archaeologist, his 30-page essay on the tunnels was certainly professional. It was completed with maps, photographs, drawings of the tunnels and chamber complex, numerous references, and overall, a very detailed document. He had provided plenty of evidence, such as the photographs of castings made of claw and tooth marks, and he suggested that it was probably made by a colony of beavers many decades ago, although he claimed beavers had been hunted to extinction in the area in the mid-1800s only beginning to show back up into the area in the late 1970s. But that led to other questions. If beavers had not been in the area for over a hundred years, how old was this tunnel network? Well, making the whole thing even more mysterious was that not one piece of wood was found throughout the complex. And William reasoned that since nothing remained and the whole thing had been sealed off and preserved, that the complex must be close to 300 years old. Although he was not a professional scientist, the ones who were would review the data and would soon echo this theory, claiming that the claw and incisor marks belonged to a beaver. However, while many agree with their findings, there were other more out-there theories, such as it was made by a prehistoric human or maybe even a rodent of unusual size. Bridges have long been a source of unexplained phenomena, 
Even people who do not believe in the paranormal have often reported the strangeness one feels when walking across bridges, particularly when doing so at night. In the past, we've looked at a bridge where, apparently, numerous dogs will go and commit suicide. There's also several legends of the so-called crybaby bridges, where at certain times you can hear the crying of a baby or screams of someone begging for help. That's kind of where this next mystery goes. The story begins with a letter to the editor of the Gazette in Colorado Springs, which was then printed into an article, one which must be pretty old because the year is hard to make out, although the month clearly states September. This anonymous writer would tell of a personal experience he had involved with unexplained phenomena. He would claim he had not told the story to many people out of fear of being judged, and he had chose to write the letter now under strict anonymity. The man had stated several years ago, at the age of 25, he and his girlfriend would take a walk along a quiet road near the outskirts of town, when they would walk over a bridge crossing a shallow stream. It was a cloudy night, but the moon was bright enough that it was not too dark. They would sit on the railing of the bridge facing the center, which allowed them to see entirely across the bridge to the other railing. As the two lovebirds sat there chatting, they would hear a sound coming down the road approaching the bridge. It didn't sound like a horse and carriage. Instead, it sounded like a good-sized dog walking along or maybe a light horse. Then the two would hear the sound on the bridge getting closer to them and then passing, stopping, turning around, and going back the way it came, leaving the bridge. It should be noted here that the writer would explain that although he was open to the belief of ghosts and the paranormal, his girlfriend was a hardcore skeptic, but it would be her that whispered to him, what was that? He would reply that he did not know, and ask her if she had seen anything, to which she confirmed, in spite of hearing something walk by, she seen nothing. The two would stare at each other in utter confusion. They knew they had heard something, either a pretty big dog or a smaller galloping horse. It was a sharp and distinct sound, like the drumming on wood with fingernails, yet the dust on the bridge remained undisturbed. The two, feeling uneasy, would cross the bridge and then go back and look down to the stream. He would report feeling severe anxiety, almost like a touch of evil. He would describe it as feeling of horror, sickness, and impending death. Since his date was with him, his foolish pride kept him standing there while all he wanted to do was run away. He could not speak because his voice would give away the fear, and just before he couldn't take it anymore, his date would whisper, let's go. He would state that the two hurried home when she would finally say, you seem to be happy as me to get away from that bridge. And he would finally confess he couldn't stand there another minute without screaming. The next day, when speaking to his lady, he would ask her if she thought the influence which caused the feeling was just kind of general or did it seem like it was coming from a particular direction. She would state that that was the weirdest part it seemed like it came from a point on the left of the stream and a little below the bridge. So he would go back to that stream and search the riverbank to see if there was any trace of a camp or any kind of a disturbance in the area to explain what they had witnessed. But he couldn't find one clue. This would end the letter and leave the editor with an enduring mystery. What did the two witness? What was this evil feeling they spoke of? What was the feeling of horror, sickness, and impending death about? and the sound of the medium-sized dog, and that sound of the fingernails drumming on the wood. Could it have been the sound of tiny devilish hooves instead? There was also the eerie undisturbed dust which left no footprints. The theories on this one come down to two basic lines of thought. First, the down-to-earth skeptical point of view. The two experienced a phenomenon which we have discussed before, panic in the woods, in which a person far from civilization, such as hunters, campers, or hikers start to sense imminent danger, causing them to want to flee the area. And although they weren't deep in the woods, the accounts suggest they were far enough away from town to be in a very remote area of the countryside. So is it possible the sensation these two both felt that overcame them could be panic in the woods? The other theory is it was a real paranormal encounter. Was it a ghost dog? Ghost horse? Or maybe Nothing like that at all. Maybe it was some kind of evil spirit or demon that the two could not see but could hear. And with bridges having an aura of strangeness, 
it makes sense that it would happen here. Other smaller theories suggest a hoax or fabrication by the editor. Take a good look at this symbol. Do you recognize it? Do you know what it's used for? Congratulations. Neither does anyone else. It's known as the right angle with downward zigzag arrow, or ANGZAR, and is part of the Unicode text encoding. And Unicode, for those that don't know, like me, is designed to support the use of text written in all of the world's major writing systems. It's used in ordinary, literary, academic, and technical context. It uses many common characters, including numerals, punctuation, and other symbols, which are unified with the standard and are not treated as specific to any given writing system. It's actually what is used to encode thousands of emoji, yet this one character is a mystery because nobody remembers why it was created. It first appeared in a 1972 monotype typeset catalog where its inclusion was unexplained. From there, it made its way to the International Organization for Standardization's Standard Generalized Markup Language Definition in 1988, likely sourced from the aforementioned monotype character set. It would eventually find its way into Unicode as part of the STIX project, or AKA, the Scientific and Technical Information Exchange back in 1997 by a woman named Barbara Beaton. The character was listed in a technical report for math and science with a short description stating right angle and downward zigzag arrow, yet there was no explanation of how it was used. Barbara would state that in spite of being involved in the Sticks project, she also did not know what the character meant or what it was used for, but she was the one that came up with the name. The glyph's appearance varies across different fonts, but generally it consists of a downward zigzag arrow over a right angle, often with the arrow crossing the corner of the angle. There are a few theories on what this could have meant at one time, or I guess still means, but largely, no one has a real idea. Some people suggest it could have been an obscure electrical engineering symbol used in Germany decades ago. Others suggest that it could have meant short circuit, while some mathematicians suggest it could have had something to do with graph geometries. Maybe the most interesting part about it though is the symbol is very similar to that of a Chaos Magic Sigil, which is a symbol or design created by a practitioner of Chaos Magic to represent a specific intention or desire. Could this old character symbol be tied to magic? Guthrie, Oklahoma is a small town in central Oklahoma, home to about 11,000 people. And although it is small, it could be hiding a huge secret or at least, that's what this conspiracy alleges, because according to many stories circulating around this town, it seems the Wild West settlement that got built in 1887 sets above a complex system of tunnels that could hide many illegal activities, or at least did. According to the legend, it was these same tunnels that were used during Prohibition to transport barrels of whiskey all around town. The most talked about tunnel is the one that ran or still runs from the site of the state's first capital in Guthrie to the Blue Bell Saloon just down the street, the same saloon that housed the brothel. But even though these tunnels are alleged to sprawl throughout town, there's no record or document in the city that confirms they existed. Instead, you have to take the word of hundreds of people that claim to have seen them, or at least heard about them, from their ancestors. Most famously is the account from 1967 where a construction worker on a team that was demolishing a building stated he had uncovered a gambling room underground filled with cards, tables, and roulette wheels. In digging deeper for the mystery, I did come by a Facebook post that talked about the tunnels, and quite a few of the citizens there mentioned going into them, with stories of paper boys using the tunnel as a shortcut to reach the other side of town quicker, to people claiming their parents took them down there to tour the tunnels when they were younger. Many spoke about how their grandparents told them stories about the state legislators who used to go down to the gambling room, bars, and brothels that hid there, while others cite the entrance of the tunnel is supposedly cleverly hidden near the goalpost of the local high school football stadium. However, a few would also claim that these so-called tunnels are nothing more 
than storm drains, and an overactive imagination. So were these tunnels built in the heart of the former capital to hide illegal gambling and drinking, or is this all a bizarre conspiracy about nothing? Born on December 13, 1893, Stanislaw Szukowski of Warta, Poland, would immigrate to the United States in 1907 at the age of 13. His family would make it to Chicago, where his father was employed as a blacksmith, and Szukowski, who was known as a prodigy in sculpture, enrolled at the Art Institute of Chicago. Just a year later, he would go back to Poland to enroll at the Academy of Fine Arts in 1910. Here, he would study under another sculptor for three years and return to Chicago. As he matured, he would join the art scene in Chicago, becoming a key part of the Chicago Renaissance, but it's a piece of work he does later in his career that would be at the center of this next bizarre conspiracy theory. In 1940, at the age of 47, Shukovsky began devoting his time to examining the mystery of prehistoric ancient history and mankind, as well as the formation of languages faiths, customs, arts, and migration of peoples. He tried to unravel the origin of geographical names, gods, and symbols that have survived in various forms in various cultures. Through his research, he would claim to have discovered Polish origins for various ancient places and people in a language called Protong. According to Szukowski, Protong could be seen in phenomenon ranging from the apparent Polish origins of Babylon to Jesus's Polish identity. The culmination of his work was put into a massive book called the Protong Pages, which included 14,000 illustrations. The volumes covered a bunch of issues, while his pen drawings of artifacts, which he considered witnesses, were done to confirm his theories. And if this is not crazy enough for you yet, better buckle in, because he further elaborated that his concept of world history, called Zermatism, suggested that all human culture derived from the Eastern Islanders, who after the Great Flood mentioned in the Bible, settled in Zermatt, Switzerland, hence the name, and that all the human languages could find traces to the original ancient mother tongue that coincidentally had Polish origins. And the craziest part, his theory was that humanity was locked in an external struggle with Yedisene, which stands for the Sons of Yeti. That's right, the offspring of Yeti and humans had enslaved humanity since the dawn of time. He even identified people like Lennon and Churchill, who he claimed were of the ape race. He would then claim that the figure of the Greek god Pan, who is half human and half goat, and whose likeness can be found on several ancient Greek vases, depict creatures that really existed. They were the products of Yeti, uh, sexually assaulting women, which I never thought I'd say. He would use his talents as an artist to illustrate his theories, which despite their lack of evidence or common sense, gained a cult following. So what to make of this theory? Well, most seem to chalk it up to some form of mental illness. Personally, I can't put much into his theories, but sometimes you just have to step back and admire the man's work. Throughout history, there have been many scientific theories that have came and went that seem laughable now, such as the geocentric model, which suggested the sun, moon, stars, and planets all revolved around the Earth, or maybe even the flat Earth or hollow Earth theories, which still some believe today. But none can reach the crazy of our next fringe theory, that which was created by a man named Cyrus Teed, a man who started off as a doctor specializing in botanical remedies which was popular in the late 19th century in which he practiced. He would then become an alchemist and pseudo-scientific religious leader and self-proclaimed messiah. He would take the name Koresh and propose the new set of scientific and religious ideas he called Korshanity that believed in the existence of a concave hollow earth where the sky, humanity, and surface of the earth existed on the inside of a universe encompassing sphere. It may be better to just try and show you a picture to get a better concept. It envisions a universe that is an inside-out version of what we know now. He instead believed the Earth is on the outside and we are looking at the inside of the universe. So kinda like a bigger version of the hollow Earth theory. In 1869, 
he received a spiritual illumination from the Divine Motherhood who told him the nature of the universe. This confirmed Teed's suspicion that the Earth was actually outside and everything else was within. This illumination would then tell him to carry on with the work of Jesus as a new Messiah, where he was to unify science and religion. It's worth noting here that this so-called illumination only came to him after he was badly electrocuted and passed out during an experiment. According to Teed, the universe occupies a hollow cell in solid rock about 8,000 miles in diameter. We live and walk on the spherical inner surface of this cell with our heads pointed towards its center. The entire universe that we see in the sky lies within this cell, cradled in the hands of God. At the center is the sun, an invisible electromagnetic battery in the form of a corkscrew rotating on a 24-hour cycle. We do not see the sun directly. Instead, its rays bend by refraction and focalize twice, and we see the second focalization. But it gets better. The sun is half dark and half light, and its rotation gives us the illusion of sunrises and sunsets, giving us night and day and season variations. The planets are disks floating between metallic layers of the Earth's crust, which is the same rock shell we walk on. This part of the Earth's shell is only 100 miles thick and has 17 layers, and the moon, planets, and stars we think we see in the sky are actually illusions within the hollow cell within this rock shell. Confused? Well, it gets better. Because gravity here comes from the special rays that come out of the sun which keep us pulled to the Earth. Teed would eventually establish the Corsian Unity, a small communal society, aka cult, where he taught the importance of celibacy and how that's related to this insane theory, I'm not sure. But it's here. He would meet a man named Ulysses Morrow, a newspaper editor, writer, and among other things, inventor. He held similar views to Teed, and Teed asked him if he could provide scientific proof of the shape of the Earth. Morrow would do just that. On July 25, 1896, he would make his observations on the old Illinois drainage canal, in which he sighted a target 18 inches above the water's surface at 5 miles away using a telescope elevated just 12 inches above the water. According to the accepted values of the Earth's curvature, the target should have been 9 feet below the line of vision. Morrow considered this undisputed proof that the world was not circular. He would do follow-up experiments, like a month later from the shore of Lake Michigan. He spotted yachts 12 miles away from the shore while he was on a pier 10 feet above the water. With a 50-power telescope, the hulls were clearly visible. He would pull off seven other successful experiments, although these were all easily dismissed by critics as nothing more than atmospheric refraction, and both Morrow and Teed would concede that it was just an illusion of perspective, but they were not finished and would continue further experiments throughout the years. However, they could never prove these theories. In 1983, a book that collected many archaeological anomalies, as well as other Fortean phenomena in North America, would debut. This book, called The Rebirth of Pan by Jim Brandon, would also collect a series of odd cryptid encounters that have been documented over the years, and he would write about them in a chapter in the book. Of these was one particularly strange. The story details the weird autumn of 1973 in the Midwest where all these sightings were occurring that could be best described as Sasquatch-like. One woman, on August 29th, in Monongahela, Pennsylvania, would report seeing a huge hairy arm with three claws hanging from the roof. She would then begin to gag on a strong sulfur odor that came from the animal. Later, hairs reeking of sulfur were on the roof as well. In McChesney Town, about an hour away, another creature would leave a handprint on the side of a home which showed three appendages in contrast to the typical five one might think of when it comes to Bigfoot. Meanwhile, in some of the mobile home parks and Derby, the cryptids were alleged to have been pounding aggressively on the sides of the metal sheathed homes. There were also numerous reports of motorists who seen shaggy bipeds racing alongside their cars on lonely roads. But that leads into our mystery, which there's not a lot of details about. According to this collection of stories, the most bizarre encounter would be that of two boys riding motorcycles out on a country road who would see what they described as huge hairy legs 
lumbering in front of them, which had no upper body visible. The cyclists reported their sighting, while also admitting their view may have been obstructed by their own headlights. The story was not elaborated on any further, and there's not much in the way of theories. Of course, the most likely scenario is they were partially blinded by their own headlights, which caused them to see something that wasn't there. Or maybe he was just a misidentified animal, like a bear. Or perhaps they seen what everyone else was reporting at that time, Sasquatch-like creatures. And maybe the light hit them in such a way that they could not see the upper body. Or maybe they ran into a cryptid never seen before that was just two hairy legs. Volcanoes are something that man has had to learn how to live with, seeing around 50 to 70 eruptions per year. And while the vast majority of these rarely do any major damage to civilization, there has been the occasional one that really transformed Earth and all life on it. In fact, the volcanic winter of 536 was caused by at least three simultaneous eruptions of uncertain origins that caused cooler temperatures throughout Europe for several years. In March 536, documents would record the skies would even darken. It caused crop failures, which along with a plague, led to the death of millions. Some scholars have pointed out that this time in history was one of the worst to be alive, with 536 specifically being mentioned as the worst year ever. And we know about this because it was just so heavily documented, from Roman historians to the patriarchs of the church in Syria with it also being recorded in Irish historical accounts. But that's not all. There's also physical evidence too, because scientists have been able to look at tree rings that show little growth in 536, while ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica also show evidence of sulfate deposits around the same time. But what happens when a huge volcanic eruption is documented with sources, but there's not a shred of physical evidence that's what this mystery looks at, because a man named Rongo Rosita, who was a Javanese philosopher and poet in the 1800s during the Dutch colonial period of the East Indies, would pen several notable works. One of these was entitled Book of Kings. In the Book of Kings, he would spend decades researching and writing a huge history of Java, which was first published in 1869. The book is thousands of pages long, and it was said he wrote three pages of it per day for 30 years. The sources he gathered this information from is still kind of uncertain, but it's thought he most likely referenced these ancient Javanese manuscripts that had been written on palm leaves. 10,000 of these palm leaf texts still survive to this day, but it's the first edition that we first read of this account about this volcano. It spoke of the world greatly shaking and violent thundering, accompanied by heavy rain and storms. The mountain copy, with a tremendous roar, would burst into pieces and sink into the earth, which caused the sea to rise, causing a many people to die, or AKA, a tsunami. The first accounting doesn't really give us the key details though. It's the updated second edition, just 16 years later, that gives us more information. This time, he would record in the year of Shaka 338, or AD 416, a thundering noise was heard from the mountain Batawara which was answered by a similar noise coming from the mountain Capi, lying westward of the modern Bantam. A great glaring fire which reached the sky came out of the last named mountain. The whole world was greatly shaken and violent thundering accompanied by heavy rains and storms took place. So first off, it's unknown which mountain Capi is referring to since that name is no longer in use. Although, some think it could be referring to the volcano Krakatoa. Now it gets a little more interesting because in this book, he also mentions a man named Jabaya, a monarch who oversaw the documenting of this volcanic eruption. According to the story, he was visited by a god who informed him of the eruption and encouraged him to make a record of it. This god told him that the event took place in AD 416. Now strangely, Jabaya was a real Japanese king of the 12th century. But was this story he told a real account that had been passed down? Or did he really think a god told him to document it? Well, that I can't answer. However, I can say, outside of everything I have told you, there's no other piece of real evidence that this eruption ever happened. So what gives? Well, of course, if we go back to the tree ring and ice core studies mentioned previously, 
We know there were three eruptions around 536 AD, and it's just possible that one of these is Krakatoa, which of course is off the coast of Java. And if we go back to the palm leaf writings, we also know in 535 AD, the writings stopped for 18 years without explanation. So it's easy to assume that Krakatoa did erupt, but the issue is this, that's in 535 AD. This story allegedly took place in 416 AD. Also, the palm leaf histories do not stop after that year, suggesting there was no eruption. So is it possible that somehow the dates just got mixed up and that the king was referencing the eruption in 535 AD instead? Or is there an unknown eruption that occurred where no physical evidence has ever been found? Most scholars believe this account is pretty dubious, since the story is not drawing on any primary sources and there's also no geological evidence to substantiate the claims. Some take it a step further and claim that there's actually no evidence that Krakatoa even erupted in 535 AD. In the 1950s, a family by the name of Cooper would purchase a home in Texas, and like many families, they were excited to settle in. So they wanted to take a picture to document the beginning of a new home and new life. So the first night they were there, the mother, grandmother, and two children would sit down and pose for a photograph at the dining room table. The father would then snap a picture and would eventually take it to get developed. But days later, when he went back to get it, he would open it and he was horrified because when he opened the film pack, this is what he saw. The kids were said to have had nightmares for years. But how much of this story is true? Well, strangely, there's multiple theories in various accounts online. Some state that in spite of the claim that this was a legit photo, that it was indeed photoshopped later on as a hoax, or that possibly the family even faked it. Others claim that it was just double exposure. Another theory states that one of the guys developing the film noticed how the family was all off to the right of the photo, leaving a big empty space on the left-hand side so he threw a negative from another photo onto the film as a prank. And the family, instead of realizing it was just a joke, took it as real evidence of the paranormal. But I also found another account that stated, one of the two boys in the photo came forward in 2015 and stated that the original photo did not have that being in it, meaning the photo was photoshopped much later on, which might be why it didn't pop up online until November 2009. Finally, a few people speculate that it might have been a genuine paranormal occurrence. When we think about the universe and how it actually works, it's almost too much to wrap our brains around. In fact, it's probably easier for most of us to just never think about it. But it's easier for some to not believe the explanation we're told at all and instead pitch a completely different theory altogether that brings us to the fringe theory known as the electric universe. According to this surprisingly wide-held belief, electricity actually rules the universe. Its currents flow along plasma filaments that shape and power galaxies, while they also go into the stars, which lights them up like fluorescent bulbs. It also powers the births of other planets. And craters that we see in these planets, that's actually electrical arcs like lightning bolts striking it. And that's actually where the Grand Canyon came from. But what about black holes, dark matter, dark energy, and the Big Bang? Yeah, none of that happened. Most of this theory has been started by a Russian-American writer named Emmanuel Velikovsky, who suggested that the gravity was related to the electrical structure of neutral matter, and that the stars were powered by galactic-scale electrical discharge currents. That would be the beginning of this very wacky theory that would keep growing and eventually became something known as the Thunderbolts Project, which the internet has helped to spread, leading to a YouTube channel with six feature-length documentaries that get between 300,000 to 1 million views. But in spite of how big this following has got, there's one issue. There's not one shred of proof of any kind. In fact, most of their details are pretty ambiguous, and the theory is not even complete enough to make predictions with, so it's not even a theory, so it can't be tested. Others defend this, though, suggesting that it provides a simpler explanation compared to the standard model of physics. The late 19th century 
may be one of the oddest times in human history. There were so many new ideas and people were really interested in the paranormal things like talking to the dead, ghosts, and new spiritual ideas. In fact, if you were going to start a religion, I can't think of a better time. And that's exactly what happened in 1882 when a dentist named John Newbrow would write a book called Oospi, A New Bible. And this book, well, John claimed it had been written by automatic writing, which is allegedly a psychic ability allowing a person to produce written words without consciously writing, like something took over his body and wrote it for him. Now, I can't get into all the details of this book because it's close to 900 pages, but the title page describes the book as A New Bible in the Words of Jehovah and His Angel Ambassadors, A Sacred History of the Dominions of the Higher and Lower Heavens on the Earth for the Past 24,000 Years, Together with a synopsis of the cosmogony of the universe, the creation of planets, the creation of man, the unseen worlds, the labor and glory of gods and goddesses in the Aetherian heavens, with the new commandments of Jehovah to man of the present day. Of course, Jehovah being the creator, who is both male and female. The basic teachings emphasize service to others, while its teachings about what happens after death are not much different than a lot of other faiths. It does differ in one way. No matter if you are a disbeliever or how immoral of a life you live, everyone eventually ends up in heaven, or at least one of the heavens since there are multiples. And it's important to note here, Newbrow stated after he released the book that it was not a sacred text, but instead just a history of different religions going back 24,000 years. But it wouldn't matter because a number of groups formed in response to the release of the book and soon became a religion called Faithists although it was never widespread. But that's neither here or there, because the mystery is actually one of the fringe theory variety, and that is something called soul ships, which are often just a metaphor, but sometimes it's a literal vehicle that transports souls to the afterlife. There are also mentions in this book of those vehicles, as well as many descriptions of what we would call UFOs. In fact, it's thought that the first time the word starship was coined is in this book, which talks about interstellar travel a lot. There are multiple verses about ships of fire or ships of light descending to Earth. There's even accounts of some people who entered onto these spacecraft and left Earth. So basically the mystery is this. If this historical account is accurate, are these the precursors to the UFO phenomena that we see now? August 13th. 1997. Shock jock Howard Stern would get a phone call that left him and his audience a bit uneasy when a man named Clay would call in with a dark, interesting claim. According to him, Clay, which was undoubtedly a fake name, would tell Howard he was a serial killer responsible for 12 murders of sex workers in New Orleans. Howard, who was definitely a very controversial person at the time, would actually go along and hit this man with question after question, pumping him to give up more information about himself. In hindsight, for a man like Stern, who a lot of the public had contempt for, this was seen as admirable, trying to coax out enough details from the man in hopes that someone could identify him. Because of this, we know that the man was white, had no tattoos, used a hammer for most of his murders, and he usually committed such acts on the side of the road. Now after Howard talked to the man for a while, he would eventually get off the phone, but not before Howard tried to convince him to turn himself in, and that was pretty much it. Although, word did come out the next day that the FBI came by to talk to Howard, who then turned the tape of the recorded call over to them, and Howard would never mention it again. Now, if you know anything about Howard Stern's show, then you will know that the program received numerous calls over the years from people claiming to have done terrible things. In fact, it's alleged that Stern himself was behind a lot of these calls to boost ratings. So the serial killer call is often written off as nothing more than a prank by Stern. However, there's one little catch here because there was a serial killer operating in New Orleans in this time period, that of the Storyville Slayer. Although it's believed this man killed at least 24 different women instead of the 12 that the caller claimed. But the similarities didn't stop there. In the investigation into the Storyville slaying, police would eventually arrest two different suspects. One was an African-American corrupt police officer named Victor Gant, who was arrested in a domestic dispute with a woman he had met during the time he had patrolled the red light districts. 
and her name was Sharon Robinson. But before Sharon could testify against him and her friend, the only other witness, were both found dead. However, DNA testing was inconclusive and Gant was released. But that brings us to the next suspect, a white man named Russell Elwood, who first came onto detectives' radars in 1994 and was finally charged and convicted of the murder of at least one of these women, that of Cheryl Lewis. Now, I had to fill you in on that because not only did this caller identify himself as a white man that targeted black prostitutes or mixed-race ones, like the story Bill Slayer did, when Howard asked the caller if he had any close calls with the police, he would laugh and say no, that they actually arrested the wrong man, a black police officer, just like the story Bill Slayer, leading many to believe that this caller was actually Russell Elwood. But there's just one problem with that. This phone call happened on August 13th, and Elwood had been arrested nine days earlier on August 4th for buying cocaine off of an undercover cop. So unless he called from jail to tell Howard all this in an interview that lasted over 15 minutes, it wasn't him. I also know phone calls are recorded in prison, but I'm not sure they are in the county jail where Elwood was. There's also the fact that Clay mentioned having a fiancé and children and had minimal drug use, unlike Elwood. And Cheryl Lewis, who Elwood was ultimately convicted of murdering, well, she was a nurse, not a sex worker. So I think we can safely rule him out. But that has left the door open for the possibility that it was another serial killer. In fact, law enforcement believe that the Storyville slayings were committed by multiple killers, meaning this phone call could still be legit. For the people who believe it was the real killer, they point out the caller's knowledge of specific details and crimes in New Orleans that is at least a little suspicious. There's also the fact that law enforcement have never been able to conclusively say that the phone call was a hoax. His demeanor also came off like a genuine psychopath. However, for the doubters, it's often brought up that the whole weird saga is never mentioned again, although it's possible law enforcement just told Howard to not discuss it anymore. And secondly is the many awkward pauses by the man, which seems to indicate he was thinking up a replies on the spot, like he's making up the story as he goes. Although, it could be argued he's taking these long pauses to carefully avoid saying anything that could get him busted. But that brings up another interesting point. About halfway through the call, Howard and Robin seem to be leading him by giving him simple yes or no questions instead of asking him for descriptive answers. Finally is the fact that in the years that followed, law enforcement questioned the credibility of the call. So I ask you, hoax or real? Let me know in the comment section below. June 4th, 2019, The Astronomer's Telegram, which is a short notice publication service for publicizing new astronomical observations, we put out a very odd note. It was that of a star named ASASSN-V, which strangely and suddenly decreased its brightness by a huge amount. Actually, 70% of its brightness was lost, and astronomers don't know why. As you may imagine, this almost instantly caught the attention of alien hunters, who believe it was some sort of alien megastructure, perhaps a Dyson Sphere, which is a hypothetical structure whose purpose would be to harness the energy emitted by a star to use for an advanced civilization, which means this sphere would be like some kind of solid shell completely encompassing the star, or perhaps even a swarm of smaller structures orbiting around it, or even a network of orbiting solar collectors Regardless, the alien hunters believe this is what caused the star to so rapidly dim. However, there are more boring theories, such as a cloud of dust just passed in front of the star casting a shadow, or an enormous planet casting an eclipse, or possibly even a second dimmer star in its orbit. Did you have an imaginary friend growing up? Or maybe you have a child that has an imaginary friend. Well, as you probably know, this is completely normal. It's estimated that between 50 and 65% of young children have an imaginary friend. Sometimes, it takes the form of a doll or stuffed animal, while other times, it's completely imaginary. And psychologists say that this is actually a good thing. But what if that imaginary friend is not sending out good vibes? Well, that's what this next mystery takes a look at. 
It starts on a Reddit post in a thread where parents shared their scariest story their child told them about their imaginary friend. The parent, under the name Professor Dog, would tell the story of when their son was first learning to talk. He would begin telling them something about a person named Purple Mommy. This person, or being, was all purple with long hair and bright, all-white eyes. It's worth noting here, Professor Dog stated that the kid, at the time, did often mix up the colors purple and black, so it's possible he meant Purple Mommy was all black. Regardless, this individual would pick him up at night and turn off the lights, which the parents thought was weird because they would often find him outside of his crib in the morning, even though he was barely walking. Purple Mommy also apparently had no mouth and could take her own head off, but it gets stranger because he would tell them Purple Mommy needed a band-aid because she had blood everywhere. And then he finished with the one that might have made them the most nervous. Purple Mommy doesn't really like Daddy. He apparently told them this stuff for around a year. When they finally asked him where Purple Mommy was, he would always point to the same spot, a corner of the room behind his closet door. The parents would report that during this phase, the child would often wake up crying. On one night, when he was really struggling, they would ask him what was wrong, and he said Purple Mommy would not let him sleep. As far as theories go, there are a few. As far as the paranormal ones go, of course, it's often suggested it could be some kind of supernatural entity, like a demon or spirit, or maybe even a shadow person. But the most common theory, however, is sleep paralysis, which can cause you to hallucinate. Or maybe it was the kid's imagination. One of the weirdest feelings most of us share is that odd memory that doesn't really exist. You know, like Sinbad never played a genie in a movie, even though a lot of people remember him doing so. Of course, I'm talking about the Mandela Effect, but that's not what this mystery is about. It's a little more specific. What if someone could control the Mandela Effect for nefarious reasons? That's what the Memory Hole Conspiracy takes a look at. The term Memory Hole was first popularized by George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, when the party's Ministry of Truth systematically recreated all potentially embarrassing historical documents, in effect reverting all of history to match the often changing state propaganda. These changes were complete and undetectable. The name comes from a small chute leading to a large incinerator used for censorship, and the conspiracy which had taken on this word is basically the things that make the powers that be embarrassed or insecure in their power are vanishing and then being retroactively erased from human memory. The problem with this conspiracy theory is there's no way to prove it. There are no examples because if you can remember something happening, then it wasn't erased, meaning it hasn't been memory hold. However, the ones that do believe in this theory often point out to things like disinformation and the strive to control the narrative, which are very real issues. Others point to things like artificial intelligence, which can manipulate video and audio pretty well, which could lead to the ability to memory hold sensitive issues. We have discussed Bigfoot how many times on this channel now? It feels like at least a hundred, and that's because on any channel that discusses paranormal or cryptid activity, well, there's just no way to get around Sasquatch. They're the biggest known cryptid in the world, but even so, they're still doubted by the larger community as a whole, in spite of large human-like footprints being found in some of the most remote areas of the world, and in spite of thousands of sightings, it's usually written off as hoaxes, or maybe the most likely, just misidentification of other animals such as bears. While there's a few who probably hallucinate the whole thing, and you can't really blame the skeptics that doubt their existence, there's never been a body found. But what if there is a theory out there that explains why this is the case? A fringe theory, maybe. Well, it seems to some that Bigfoot is really just a hologram. That's right, a hologram. According to this theory, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Yeti, whatever you want to call them, is actually a three-dimensional hologram projected from space by an unknown intelligence. But who this intelligence is and why they are doing it is unknown. However, as obscure and crazy as this theory is, I've actually heard it before. The theory actually ties into the simulation theory. 
He basically states, if we are living in a simulated reality, then whoever is running the simulation may program in these paranormal sightings, such as UFOs and cryptids, to study how people react to them. And then, when this person who witnessed it goes out and tells other people what they spotted, the programmers could then watch how these people respond to the claim, and so on, and so on. He could also explain why there's never been a body found, and why these things are only spotted by select people. Death. It's a subject most of us will spend all of our time trying to avoid thinking about, despite the fact that we are currently dying. But in the strictest terms, what is death? According to science, a person is dead once they go into cardiac arrest, which is when the electrical impulse that drives the heartbeat stops. As a result, the heart locks up and you are considered clinically dead. But what about the person experiencing it? Does everything stop for them immediately? Or is it something that slowly creeps in and then you start to slowly fade out? That's the question many near-death researchers have spent decades studying, and they found some pretty interesting things. One of these studies found that a surge of electricity enters the brain moments before brain death. The study involved teams in 25 hospitals monitoring dying patients' brain activity during resuscitation attempts, observing spikes in brain electrical activity after the heart stopped. Only 10% of the patients in the study were revived, and of these, 28 were interviewed about their experiences, with 11 reporting awareness during the CPR and 6 reporting near-death experiences, which has led some scientists to think that near-death experiences may be caused by reduced blood flow and abnormal electrical behavior inside the brain. So that stereotypical tunnel of white light might derive from a surge of neural activity. In the cases where patients reported awareness of what was going on during their death, they would report leaving their body and floating around the room and also being aware of the medical team working on their body. They've been able to describe watching the doctors and nurses working and having full awareness of the conversations and other visual things going on that should have not been knowable to them. So how is this possible? Well, even after breathing and heartbeat stops, you remain conscious for about 2 to 20 seconds. That's how long the cerebral cortex is thought to last without oxygen, which is the thinking and decision-making part of the brain. So it is still able to decipher information gathered from the senses. When someone is revived during this crucial period, it explains these visions they have. However, much of this is still unknown, and some critics still argue that there is no direct link between brain waves and conscious activity during near-death experiences. July 27th and 28th, 1566, Basel, Switzerland. A series of events would occur that can only be described as unexplained phenomenon. According to a leaflet recorded by a man named Samuel Cocius, on the 27th, the sun, after it had shined warm all day long with clear bright skies, it would suddenly take a different shape and color that night. First, it lost its glow and was no bigger than a full moon. Then it began to weep tears of blood and the sky behind it went dark. This was witnessed by many people in the city as well as in the countryside. This would be followed on by the moon, which was almost full, and shine through the night with an almost blood red color. The next morning, around 6 a.m., the sun rose up again with the same appearance as the night before. It lit up all the houses, streets, and everything with a blood red and fiery color. This would be the first sighting. However, it was not over, because a week and a half later, on August 7th, the document would record that the town seen many large black spheres coming and going with a great speed and precision in front of the sun, and they chattered as if they had led a fight. Many of them were fiery red and soon crumbled and then extinguished. This, of course, is one of the weirdest events from history. So, what exactly happened? As you may have guessed, there are varying theories. Some believe that if a really bad forest fire had taken a hold somewhere in the region, it could have caused smoke to travel for miles. And it's possible that the residents seen smoke and ashes in the sky without seeing fire. The black masses could have just been the ashes, since they turned a fiery red and then soon extinguished. 
and considering the moon was red, this means the fire probably burned down for days. However, Basel was the only town to report this, meaning the events were a local one. Others cite that it could have been a meteor storm, which would explain the red glow the sun had. A problem with this though, is the writing said the sky was black and red, and not white, like a meteorite is when falling to Earth. Then, there's the volcano theory, which is similar to the forest fire theory, except it would have been volcanic ashes. But why didn't anyone else report it? And why was there a delay between the 28th and August 7th? Another theory is similar to that of the Dancing Plague of 1518 theory, which states that the people had all consumed something that made them all hallucinate, while others speculate that it could have been mass hysteria, and of course, finally, a UFO battle. What's really odd about this one is just five years prior, the people of Nuremberg, around 275 miles away, experienced a similar event, which was described as an aerial battle. When one thinks about paranormal encounters, we often visualize an unidentified aircraft drifting across the night sky before it darts off into the distance. Or, we think about that of the eerie screams one may hear during an exorcism. Or for some, you may have even felt that cold temperature change when a spirit enters the room. These are typically things spoken about among paranormal encounters. However, one thing that's not often discussed is smell. Which is odd, because you would think this would be brought up more often. But one strange thing about smell and the paranormal is, a lot of unexplained phenomena is often accompanied by the smell of sulfur, which is like a rotten egg type smell, or sometimes burnt electrical wiring. It occurs near volcanoes and hot springs, and ingesting too much of it can kill a person. But the smell has been recorded from everything involving demonic possessions, UFOs, to Sasquatch encounters. One famous encounter deals with a 23-year-old woman named Avete Clementia Felipe of Sao Vicente, Brazil, who was staying alone at her sister-in-law's home in 1978 when she suddenly would see a little blue light in the sky far away. It approached the home extremely quickly and grew in size and began to strobe a startling array of colors. She then began to hear a buzzing sound as it went around the home. In spite of shutting the doors and windows, it still lit up the inside of the home. Yvette would report being so scared she ran and hid under the bed until her sister-in-law and cousin arrived home, who would later confirm that when they arrived, they too saw this weird aircraft. But to keep part of this story that relates to our mystery, everyone in the encounter reported the smell of sulfur. Then, another famous encounter, which we looked at back on part 10 of the mega series when we discussed the Big Muddy cryptid sightings, took place on June 1973 in Murfreesboro, Illinois. If you don't remember the details, one woman named Cheryl and her boyfriend Randy were on the back porch when they heard rustling in the bushes. Upon investigating it, they found a real tall, hairy creature. The hair was all matted, and the key word again was they reported a real bad sulfur smell. When asked about it later, they speculated that may have came from a layer of river slime covering the beast. While other witnesses that seen this creature during this time frame claimed it smelled rotten or sewage-like. Heck, even on an earlier subject in this video, the one about the disembodied hairy legs, in the story, it mentioned several Sasquatch-like sightings in the Midwest in the autumn of 1973. One of these was a woman seeing a huge hairy arm with three claws hanging from her roof. She claimed the smell of sulfur was so strong, she began to gag. Another famous encounter was one from paranormal author Christopher K. Coleman, who lived next to a historical park where the Battle of Bentonville took place in the Civil War. Coleman would record that when he was cutting wood in March 1990, he would all of a sudden start to hear the sounds and smells of battle, like he had been transported back in time. The event scared him enough that he dropped his chainsaw and fell to the ground. Terrified by the sensation of bullets and artillery passing over, the weird experience stopped just abruptly as it began. He fled back to his home, leaving his chainsaw where it laid for weeks because he was too afraid to go get it. And again, the smell of sulfur, or what he claimed was the awkward smell of gunpowder, was present. Another instance is that of a Chilean man, Cariaga Gonzalez, 
who noticed a large monkey-like animal on the side of the road on June 24, 2000. When he stopped to investigate, he reported a strong smell of sulfur that was nauseating. The creature then let out a howl, and Gonzalez fled. And there are many more of these types of stories, ranging from the men in black encounters to smaller cryptids like Chupacabra. So why does this certain odor pop up so frequently in paranormal events? Is it possible that they are all a singular phenomenon? Maybe UFOs, cryptids, and ghosts in themselves are not the mystery. Instead, there's some kind of force or energy that manifests these sightings, which then produces the smell. Others suggest that it's possible that a lot of these beings smell like sulfur because they live underground, such as Sasquatches, who some believe inhabit deep cave systems, or demons, which obviously live in hell. If you know anything about the history of the role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons, you'll know that in the 1980s, they received a lot of negative press for its so-called connections to Satanism. As many religious organizations claimed the game was linked to satanic ritual abuse and that the game was a tool for cults to recruit people. Of course, the whole phase would die down eventually, and it went on to become mainstream in the popular series Big Bang Theory, which first aired in 2007. So that must be why, in 2008, the religious right needed a new satanic enemy. That's when Virginia candidate for Lieutenant Governor E.W. Jackson stepped in to warn all Christians about the links between Satanism and yoga. That's right, like Jackson, many of us have driven by that yoga studio downtown and felt that aura of evil that permeates about as the soccer moms and senior citizens go in to do their stretches. We all know something else is going on. Let me give it to you in Jackson's words from his 2008 book, The Ten Commandments to an Extraordinary Life. When one hears the word meditation, it conjures an image of Maharishi Yoga talking about finding a mantra and striving for nirvana. The purpose of such meditation is to empty oneself. Satan is happy to invade the empty vacuum of your soul and possess it. That is why people serve Satan without even knowing it or deciding it. But no one can be a child of God without making a decision to surrender to him. Beware of systems of spirituality which tell you to empty yourself. You will end up filled with something you probably do not want. Now, if this was just Jackson saying this, you could maybe just say he's crazy, but there's actually many Christians who would claim the same thing. In 2015, a father, Roland Calhoun of Northern Ireland, would make news when he stated yoga presented a spiritual health risk. He would explain that while people would go in with good intentions, they could set up on a path towards a bad spiritual domain and even run into Satan and fallen angels. He would follow up by saying Pope Francis did not seek spiritual answers in yoga classes. And it seems like this is more of a fear of Hinduism than anything else. Because in 2011, the Vatican's own chief exorcist, Gabriella Morth, would state that all Eastern religions are based on the false belief of reincarnation and that practicing yoga is satanic and leads to evil, just like reading Harry Potter. Whereas Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, later to be Pope Benedict XVI, would cite that transcendental meditation could degenerate into a cult of the body which devalues prayer. While Pastor John Lindell of James River Church in Ozark, Missouri, a mega church with almost 11,000 members, delivered a whole sermon warning against yoga, stating that it has demonic roots and should be avoided by Christians, comparing it to fortune-telling and Wicca. It should be noted, though, in March 2023, John Lindell claimed his church used the power of faith to miraculously regrow one of its church members' toes who had it amputated in the past, and he never provided any proof. But E.W. Jackson isn't the only politician to jump into this conspiracy, either. Christina Caramo, who ran for Michigan Secretary of State in 2022, would claim that yoga was a satanic ritual, stating, So people are thinking they're doing exercises. No, you're doing actual, a satanic ritual, and don't even know it. Like it's not a cultural dance. It's a demonic ceremony. What's wrong with you? But people don't understand that. It's because our worldview is so skewed. It's worth noting, Karamo also thought demonic possession could be transferred through sexual relations. But it's not only the leaders of the church and politicians getting in on the action. 
Yasmin Suri, a conservative Christian influencer and grifter with over 30,000 Facebook followers, would make waves in 2020 when she suggested the new yoga theme Barbie called Breathe With Me was really a demonic attachment that could lead children to be possessed by demons and make them suicidal. She would further claim it was to indoctrinate children for Satan's glory and then destroy them. So, are all these people owned to something or is this just a harmless exercise? Let me know in the comment section below. George Van Tassel was an interesting man born in 1910 in Ohio. Growing up and reaching the age of 20, he would move off to California where he became a mechanic at a garage owned by his uncle. And in later years, he would move on to become an aircraft mechanic and flight inspector who worked for companies such as Lockheed. But in 1947, he would leave the booming aerospace industry to live a simple life in the desert with his family and building a cafe, gas station, store, small airstrip, and guest ranch. And in 1953, he began hosting meditation groups. And it's this year that something would change for him because according to Van Tassel, the occupant of a spaceship from the planet Venus named Sogonda would land at his airstrip and wake him up, then invited him on board to his spaceship where he then provided Van Tassel with a formula to build a machine capable of generating electrostatic energy to suspend gravity, extend human life, and facilitate time travel. And I know this sounds odd, but alien contactee stories in the 1950s were actually pretty popular. So it's not crazy in itself, because there were many other claims like this at the time. What makes Van Tassel's different is this so-called technique to rejuvenate the body. It took hold of Van Tassel, and just a year later, him and others began building what they called Integratron to perform rejuvenation. According to him, it was a structure for scientific research into time, anti-gravity, and extending human life with the aim to recharge and rejuvenate people's cells. Oh, and it was also going to be capable of anti-gravity and time travel. The domed wood structure has a rotating metal apparatus on the outside he called electrostatic die rod. It was made of wood, concrete, glass, fiberglass, and without any metal screws or nails. The inner workings were a combination of high voltage Tesla coil and a split ring resonator that generated electromagnetic frequencies. Van Tassel speculated that electromagnetism affected biological cells and believed that every biological cell had a unique resonant electromagnetic frequency. According to Van Tassel, the generation of strong ultra-wideband electromagnetic frequencies by the Integratron resonates with the cell's frequency and recharges the cellular structure as if it were an electrical battery. The human cells rejuvenated while inside the structure. He did some of this with the money from an annual spacecraft convention he hosted for 25 years, with one receiving 10,000 attendees, which often included the famous contactees at the time. Unfortunately for Van Tassel, he would suddenly die just a few weeks before its official opening, without ever seeing his life's work come to fruition, which of course was largely seen as pseudoscience. But I ask you, was Van Tassel onto something? Along an ancient road known as Irwin Lane in Saltersford, Cheshire, England, stands a peculiar memorial stone with an inscription that read, here John Turner was cast away in a heavy snowstorm in the night in or about the year 1755. What makes this inscription so strange though is what's on the back, but I'll get to that in a second. First, we must ask, who was John Turner? According to an English author, Alan Garner, who wrote a novel based on the account, he tells us that John Turner was born in 1706 and grew up in Saldersford Hall where his father was a farmer. John would grow up to be a peddler, mainly transporting salt, which he carried from Chester to Northwich to Derby, and then would return back with malt. On Christmas Eve in 1735, when he was 29 years old, he would make his way back from Northwich and it began to snow. Luckily for him, these peddlers were used to being on the road in all weather and all hours. They knew the paths like the back of their hand and in general knew how to safely get back and forth. Since it was Christmas Eve, John wanted to make it home with his family. So against the advice of others, he pressed on into the blizzard. 
When he failed to reach it home the next morning, a search party was organized to set off and find him, which didn't take long because he was found less than a mile from home, frozen to death and covered by snow, while his horses survived. Now at first you might think, well he froze to death, and that's an awful story, but he probably just got lost, and that's not really a mystery. But I'm getting to that. Remember that inscription on the back that I told you about? Yeah, it references the most baffling part of this whole saga. Because on the windswept white ground lay the pristine single print of a woman's shoe in the snow. Yeah, so a very strange one, and I can't find very much about it. Although, there seems to be at least one discrepancy. For one, the stone records his death as 1755, but the story says that John died in 1735. Of course, the stonemason could have just made a mistake, but it does show that the stone was made years after he died. However, one other odd thing I found with this one is, there's no records of John in the 18th century who was the churches that recorded births, and it wouldn't be that unusual for them to have simply missed John. The records were by no means thorough, and the records here are at best spotty. However, John's case is different because he was a salt packman and they all had to be licensed. And while the church may have slacked on keeping records, you can be sure that John would have gotten a license to transport the salt, and likewise, the government would have been sure to keep that record. Yet, in the public record office, there is no record of a license being issued to any John Turner. So that in itself is a mystery. Did John really exist? If not, why is this random headstone on the side of this old road? If he did exist, and suffered this horrible death, what was with this lone woman's shoe print next to his body? <sighs> April 1988, Swiss explorer Gregor Spori would go to Egypt with the intention of learning about ancient Egyptian culture. During his trip, he spent time in the Great Pyramid trying to find evidence of biocosmic energy but was unsuccessful. On the recommendation of a bartender, Spori embarked on an excursion near Sadat City about 60 miles northwest of Cairo. While there, he met an elderly farmer named Nagib, who was descended from a family of grave robbers. This man would offer to show him an unusual object for a fee of $300, which Spori happily accepted. This man would then bring the object back, and I can only imagine Spori's surprise to see a mummified finger wrapped in old rags, but it wasn't just any ordinary finger. This finger was 15 inches long. Spory examined it closely and observed that it appeared old, organic, and humanoid with leathery skin and a loose nail. It also had a musky smell and it was split open on the bend of the finger and covered with dry mold. Nagi presented Spory with documents including a certificate of authenticity Arabic and Latin letters, and an x-ray of the finger taken in the 1960s. Researchers who have looked into the pictures estimate that it belonged to a creature or being that was over 16 feet tall, although most of the scientists he had taken the photos to doubted its authenticity. This would be a huge deal if it could be proven real though, but Spory was disappointed to learn that although he was allowed to hold it and even take pictures, he was forbidden to study the finger any further. And why, you might ask? According to Spory, the finger belonged to a grave robber that acquired it illegally while searching through an undisclosed tomb in Egypt, so obviously he couldn't just hand it over. But in 2009, Spory went back to try and find these local guides that put him into contact with Nagib, but he could not find his old connections, nor could he find Nagib. And while it sounded like Spory just got swindled when it came to the finger, it's worth pointing out that Flavius Josephus, the Roman slash Jewish historian and military leader, spoke of giants that had taken part in several European wars. Others think it could have been connected to ancient aliens. However, the most skeptical point of view is that Spory just got duped by a giant finger made of clay. This brings us to the end of part four of the obscure Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg Explained. We are about two-thirds of the way through the second layer now. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.